Hello, my name is Jeremy Peterson, and today I'm going to be giving a presentation about the blog I created throughout the semester, The Bigger Picture. My blog is focused on the basics of photography. I detail some of the most crucial and fundamental elements of photography. These ideas, tips, and tricks are useful for anyone who is trying to step up their photography to the next level, from casual hobbyists who want to take pretty pictures to those with a new passion who are considering working their way up to shooting images professionally. There's a lot of good information and plenty of tricks to help newcomers get in a head start to, with their photography journey. When I started thinking about creating this blog, I wanted to figure out where I should start. I had some ideas for what content I wanted to post, but I didn't know what formats would be the most effective for my content, whether it would be lists, short stories, sectional posts, videos, tutorials, who knows. I decided that I needed to conduct some market research. I knew a number of photography blogs already, like Photo Focus or Behind the Shutter, Dave Morrow or Mark Denny, some of my favorites. I decided to visit their pages and some others to gain more inspiration. I wanted to understand what was working for my influences and what I could improve upon. I learned that many blogs and teachers wanted to teach their lessons in photography as if there was no compromise. Some blogs stated information as though the rules were hard fast and there was no leeway with them. But I knew from experience that this is not the case. Of course, there are principles that, at their roots, fundamentally create a better photograph. However, art is all about user expression. Twisting the rules and applying those basic elements of photography in different ways can end up creating some of the most interesting imagery. I wanted to utilize the similar information and principles that was found on many blogs across the internet, but emphasize that those rules were meant to be broken and that the most important part about creating good photography is merging your personal artistic style with all of these foundational lessons. I also wanted my page to visually be different than some of my inspirations. Many of the blogs I had seen around had been around for so long. They had amassed an incredible amount of content. However, in doing so, their web pages felt cluttered, and they felt too busy for me to easily navigate. I believe sometimes it's better to keep things more simple and to the point. Outside of content, I felt design of my blog would be a way for me to stand out from my competition. After I gained more insight about what I wanted my blog to be, how, what it would be about, and how I would stand out from my competition, I needed to identify who I was going to be creating content for. I analyzed myself, my writing style, my photography style, and the desired content I wanted to share, and determined that my target market consisted of people who were newly interested in photography, and even those who were not necessarily new, but simply wanted to learn more about photography. They may have already have some experience around a camera, but most of my readers are those who really just wanted to learn more about the inner workings of making a good image. My target market is made up of both men and women, ages 16 to about 30. Because I primarily shoot landscapes and nature scenes, I assume most of my crowd will be into that same style. They'll be a little more outdoorsy rather than shooting portraiture. Many of my readers will have a heavy social media influence. They want to take better pictures simply to make their online profiles and posts stand out more or become more visually appealing. I'm also from Utah, so most of my readers, I assume, will be from the surrounding area and then slowly branch out to surrounding states as I grow. States like Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, Nevada, that kind of thing. Now that we've talked about the behind the scenes of my blog, let's take a look at the blog itself. As you can see, my design is very simple and it's straightforward. I have a static homepage that gives vital information about what a reader will find on my blog. In the header at the top of the page, you can see my own personal logo and the navigation bar below. The navigation bar allows a visitor to easily move between the different pages on the site. At the bottom of the page in the footer, I have a number of widgets, including a search bar, social media icons, a follow button for my blog, and a categories list for all of my posts to allow a reader to easily navigate what types of content they want to see. 
Moving back to the top of the page, across the navigation bar, I have a number of pages. The blog posts page, a gallery page, an about me page, and a contact and FAQ page. On the gallery page, I showcase my own photographs. This page is filled with my own personal work. Some of my favorite photographs that I've taken over the years. The next page is an about me page. And finally, a contact and FAQ page. On that page, I have directly linked my own email address. So if anybody reading had a specific question, they could email me directly. Following all of that contact information are some of the most commonly asked questions that I've seen from new photographers. This section was created in hopes that a new reader could come to this page and hopefully find the answers to some of their questions without having to navigate through too many posts that didn't seem relevant to them at the time. Now, moving back to the navigation bar to the blog posts page. This page is really the bulk of my website. This is where a viewer would find all of my content. At the top of the page, I have pinned a featured post. This will change over time, depending on whatever posts seem most important or relevant at the time. Following the featured post, you can find the rest of my content, starting from the most recent post all the way down to the first post I have shared. Of course, as you scroll down the page, there's a back to top button at the top of the window to easily move back without scrolling. My posts vary between a number of different styles, including lists, sectionals, narratives, and videos. They cover a range of topics, which are all important to building a good foundation in photography. Some of my favorite posts, however, are the how-to videos. I've created instructional videos on how to work with some of the image processing softwares, such as Photoshop. This ex video, for example, shows how easy it is to change the background color in an image without altering any of the colors to your subject. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Jeremy Peterson, and this video is going to be a brief overview of Adobe's Photoshop, as well as a quick demonstration of one of the features you can do in the program. Now, there's a lot to do in Photoshop, but first, what is it? Photoshop is a photo editing, image creation, and graphic design software. Anyone from hobbyists to professional photographers to digital designers use Photoshop for a myriad of reasons. You can spend hours and hours learning and still not even come close to understanding everything the program has to offer. Because there's so much to do and so much to learn in Photoshop, I'm just going to give you a quick understanding of the layout as well as a demonstration of one of the cool things you can do with the program. At a glance, the layout is relatively simple. You have some of your main tools in the toolbar to the left. You have selection tools, crop tools, brush tools, spot removal tools, and much more. At the top of the window, you can see different options available depending on the tool you have selected. For example, if the brush tool is selected, you have the option of changing the size, hardness, opacity, and flow of the brush at the top. Moving to the right side of the window, you can see your Adjustments tab as well as your Layers tab. Starting with the Layers tab at the bottom, this is where all of your files will live. You can create a number of layers to go on top of your background file to help target your edit. Above, you see the Adjustments tab. This is where you can go to find different adjustments to use on your layers. As you play around with the software, you become more and more familiar with how to use each of these tools. In addition, there are plenty of resources online to help you understand how to use all of the features. Now, I'm sure you've taken a picture before and thought, oh man, if only these colors were different, the picture would have been so much better. Maybe it was the color of somebody's jacket, maybe it was the wall behind your subject, or maybe you just want to get really creative and turn grass purple or make water red. The feature I'm going to demonstrate for you today is how to change colors. It's very simple and it can be done pretty quickly too. I'll use this picture I found on the internet as an example. It has good contrasting colors that will be really easy for us to work with. Now this blue wall does look pretty nice, it contrasts well with the red shirt and red shoes, but maybe we want to change it to green instead. First, we'll create a new layer. We can do that by clicking the Create New Layer button in the bottom right corner. Adding new layers ensures that whatever work we do, we're not directly changing our background image. That way, if we mess up, we can go back and rework the process. Next, we're going to go up to the Select menu at the top of the window and scroll down to the Color Range button. Click this, and it's going to bring up a small menu that we can use to preview our selection. At the bottom of the window, there are several options for us to choose from it to preview our, different, our selection in different ways. Grayscale, black matte, white matte, and quick mask. 
Personally, I prefer to use grayscale because it allows me to see any spots that I may have missed within my selection very easily. With grayscale, everything selected will be in white and everything that's not selected will be in black. Now, notice all of these little droppers on the right-hand side of the window. The one we have currently selected will allow us to choose our target color. The dropper with the plus sign on it will allow us to add to our selection, and the one with the minus will allow us to subtract from our selection. By selecting anywhere on the background, it does somewhat of a decent job with our selecting, but a lot of the background is still black. So we need to add to the selection with the plus dropper. Click around the background a few more times until the background is completely white. Make sure that your selection is correct, and then click OK. Notice that there are a bunch of little marching ants around the outside of the image and around the subject. These marching ants, so to speak, show us what we have selected on our layer. Now that we have a selection on our layer, we'll just add a hue and saturation adjustment on top of it so that we can change the color of our selection. This can be found in the Adjustments tab just above the Layers tab. With the adjustment layer added, we can change the hue and it will change the color of our background. Easy as that. Now you know how to change colors with ease in Photoshop, and hopefully you learned a little bit more about the software too. In closing, my blog is centered around building up the basics of photography for any new photographers from casual hobbyists to those who may be looking for a good starting place to start their photography careers. My blog covers many topics that provide a great foundational understanding on how to create a good picture. But I also want to emphasize that no matter what the rules are, one of the biggest factor factors to creating a good photograph is implementing your own style. Rules can only take you so far. Sometimes the rules are meant to be broken. Learn the fundamentals and apply them where you see fit, and you'll be able to create artwork that you can be proud of.